Talk Radio Europe. Friday Sports Bar with Tom Ordworth. Well, good evening and welcome back to the show. On the line now from Madrid, seven times Grand Slam winner, former world number one. He was inducted into the Tennis Hall of Fame in 2002, Mats Wielander. Before we bring him on, just have a little listen to this. Probably the toughest mental player that I ever played, and that's saying something. I, mean, I played guys by the name of Bjorn Borg, Jimmy Connors, even guys uh, at the end of my career, Agassi and Sampras. But this guy, Matt Villander, really used it up here. And I'm proud to say that we were part of history when the two of us went out there playing for our respective countries and stayed out there just a mere six and a half hours. Matt Villander, good evening. Welcome to the show. What a fitting tribute from a, a certain John McEnroe. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I still remember that match. He didn't mention that he happened to win that match, but uh, yeah, no, I was lucky, lucky enough to grow up and play in a, in a great era with a lot of great champions. So. Matt, it's fantastic to have you on the show. Thanks for talking to us. Um, you're up in uh, Madrid this weekend. Tell us what you're doing with yourself up there. Well, I'm here at the Mutual Madrid Open, a uh, big tennis tournament with uh, the best uh, Rafael Nadal, Roger Federer, and, and the Caroline Wozniak and Maria Sharapova. So it's a combined event. I'm working for Eurosport and doing some interviews and, and uh, some TV stuff. Well, fantastic. It's only a, a little brief visit for you. Um, Matt, so one of the things that we wanted to talk to you, I certainly wanted to talk to you, you've got this great concept going in, in the States with your business partner, Cameron, Cameron Lickle. It's called the WOW Experience. V-Lander on wheels. Tell us about that. Well, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're actually traveling around so far only the United States and Canada, but we're traveling around in a Winnebago or a motorhome, uh, and uh, we're teaching tennis. Uh, I wanted to take the whole tennis, sort of tennis fantasy experience. There's two people. Uh, I used to do it where people get on a plane and you go to some fancy hotel in Hawaii or, or even in Marbella, but it costs money and, and uh, people can't afford most of it. So uh, we go to their clubs or to their private courts and we can conduct uh, very exclusive clinics um, for a very affordable prices. So it's a, it's a fun thing. I love camping and I love teaching tennis. So I have uh, uh, have both of the uh, best of best of both worlds right now. It's great. And it, it does look very fun. You've got a fantastic website, www.vlanderonwheels.com. There's lots of good video of you and Cameron on the road. Um, Cameron, I mean, of course, uh, Matt, you're very uh, famous around the world, you know, through your achievements on the tennis courts, uh, former world number one, seven times Grand Slam winner. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about uh, Cameron's background and how he came to work with you. Well, Cameron Lickle is actually uh, uh, went through the Naval Academy, uh, went to the uh, to the war down uh, out in the uh, in the Gulf for a couple of years. Uh, he's a nuclear engineer, and uh, he decided at some some crazy night in uh, in the Gulf where something bad happened on the, on aboard one of the ships, uh, he decided that he didn't want to die and he wants to pursue his dream of playing professional tennis. So he started playing tennis seriously. Played number one for the Navy and then uh, I met him in Sun Valley, Idaho one day and we hit some balls and I told him about my idea and he he was game so uh, he's basically the brains behind the operation and uh, and I'm the guy out there just having fun. And I think most people that spent as much time together in a camper van as, as you guys do would probably end up killing each other but uh, you seem to have a real nice understanding and a lot of fun together. Yeah, we do have a lot of fun together, but I think still it's a, you know, the reward of the whole uh, expedition is really going to go into people's uh, home clubs and playing tennis with people where they're comfortable, uh, where they can do a clinic together with their kids or together with their spouse, uh, or they bring the family to videotape it and they might even win a point against me and then they can put that on YouTube and they can throw it out on their mobile phone. So uh, the reward, again, is people's uh, excitement and enthusiasm after that they realize that I'm just out there and we're just out there having having fun trying to have people have more fun and help them with their tennis and we're on the uh, first name basis after five minutes and, uh, and basically you become friends because traveling around the world I meet a lot of I've met a lot of people but I haven't made a lot of friends because you're a, you're a tennis player and you meet fans but this is they're not really fans they're just tennis fanatics and um, and they realize that the top players in the past are normal human beings and we actually have a passion for the sport and I love to spread that around. 
Matt, it's also got a slightly deeper meaning, VLander on Wheels. You guys have got an affiliation with, uh, with Deborah, which is an organization that leads the way in finding a cure, f- cure for a very rare disease that your young son, Eric, suffers from, uh, called EB. D- d- tell us what EB is all about, and, and how's that affected Eric and, and your family and your way of life? Well, uh, EB is short for epidermal bullosa, which is a genetic disease, and it affects your skin. Uh, and uh, my son, Eric, uh, I have four kids, actually, but one of my kids, Eric, is 13 years old, and, uh, and he, he suffers from getting really bad blistering on any body part where there's friction, so mainly uh, on their feet. And uh, it's actually so bad that he can't, he can't do anything in the summer, no sports. He can, he can walk around a little bit, but not too much. Uh, and uh, so basically he has, has, has had to alter his lifestyle. We moved to Idaho up in the cold uh, cold and dry climate and he's able to play ice hockey in the winter. So uh, he is fine. Uh, it's a very rare disease. Uh, there's about 35,000 uh, people in America that have it. Um, and um, it's hard to get funding for it. Insurance companies don't, don't cover uh, diseases where prevention is the only, not cure, but the only help. So we're trying to help out families and, and trying to find a cure for it but but uh, the cure is uh, long it's far away but helping families out financially is really what we're about well we sincerely w- wish you well in your efforts uh, with deborah to try and find Thanks. a cure for this uh, matt uh, matt i see uh, vlander on wheels is coming to europe although just temporary during the french open which is pretty much like going to home for you because you've won the tournament three times H- have you got any thoughts of uh, maybe doing a more p- permanent program throughout europe during the summer um, not this year, most probably, but yeah, in the future, we'd like to go around the whole the whole world and do it. Uh, we might have to buy a, a Winnebago or a house mobile uh, in Europe as well so we can drive it around, because that's really the, the meat of the operation is to be able to... I've seen the world from the air, and I now want to see the world from the roads, and I want to go to the small cities and the small tennis clubs, and uh, you need wheels for that. But yes, we're, we're, we're definitely trying to expand, and we're not really sure where it takes. It's kind of like my tennis career. You don't play tennis to win grand slams you play tennis because you're passionate about the sport and you want to improve and this vlan on wheels business is pretty much the same thing we take the, uh, every day as it comes and it keeps growing and i'm not really sure what the end result is supposed to look like and nor do i want to find out <laughs> well hopefully if you do make a decision to come to europe matt you bear us uh, in mind down here in marbella manolo santana is our famous uh, tennis star that lives down here he's got his own tennis club and there's lots of tennis fans down here that would love to see you so hopefully you'll bear us in mind uh, Matt, uh, just a little bit about your career itself. I mean, former world number one, 33 career titles, seven Grand Slam titles in there. Uh, there's no Wimbledon on that CV, but I think a lot of people have seemed to have forgotten that when they don't see that uh, on your CV, they, it suggests you're not a very good player on the surface of grass. However, two of your three Australian Opens actually came on grass, so it suggests you can play on that surface. Why did you never win Wimbledon? What, what do you put that down to? Um, you know, I think that first of all, I'm, not, I'm definitely not a grass court specialist in the old days where you had to serve in Bali. Um, the reason I did well in Australia is because we had a chance to go and prepare there for about a month on grass before. Uh, as, as most uh, tennis people know, Wimbledon comes pretty much straight after the French Open. I did really well at the French Open, and that's on very slow clay courts, and then you only give yourself about 10 days to prepare for a very fast surface at Wimbledon in the 80s. So you had to uh, change your the way you play and I think the difference today is Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer can go to Wimbledon and play pretty much the same game they did at the French Open except the balance is lower so the differences are bigger but again no I'm not a natural servant baller and it was tough for me to uh, to make that change in that short a time I did with Wimbledon on the other hand with my best friend Joachim Neustrom in doubles and to be honest I wouldn't change that victory for a singles victory because at least as a tennis player I have a memory that I can share or victory I can and share with somebody else because it's a lonely sport. Well, it certainly is. And uh, but Matt's 19, 1988 was certainly the pinnacle of your career. I mean, you ended Ivan Lendl's three-year reign at the top of the world rankings. You won three out of the four slams. Uh, I mean, tremendous. You beat Pat Cash in his own backyard in Australia. Uh, another local favourite, Henri Leconte, you defeated in the French Open in Paris. Um, and of course, that uh, superb match against Ivan Lendl in the U.S. Open. I mean, which one of those three slams in '88 was probably your most satisfying? 
You know, it's hard to, hard to compare beating Pat Cash in Australia uh, in five sets on Australia Day. They were turning 200 years old, the country, uh, and everybody was against me, obviously. That was a tough match to, uh, to actually win because I, I would like to see Pat Cash, who's a good friend of mine, win that at home. Uh, Ivan Landel, on the other hand, at the U.S. Open, I lived about 45 minutes away. I had my mom and dad there for the, for the first time in America. I had all my friends seeing. So I think that was more special. Plus, it gave me the number one ranking in the world. But, um, but again, that's all part of, uh, you know, it's part of the past. Uh, I'm not here uh, it, working for Eurosport because of my past. I'm here. I love the sport. Uh, I'm still learning, and I am uh, new at this game right now. So, um, yeah, it's not like you can dig up the past and, and enjoy it. It's, it's, uh, it's part of the past, and right now I'm, I'm just enjoying the game. It's, it's in a great state right now. Matt, so I've got a gentleman in the studio here who's been involved in sport for most of his life at the highest level as well. Um, he'd like to ask you a question. It's John. Hi, Matt. Uh, hey, John. John Smith. Um, one of the clients that I represent is uh, a guy called Freddie Jungberg, and I spoke to him this morning and told him I'd be on a radio program, which I'd be sharing a platform with you later this evening, and he wanted to give you a big hug, said he enjoyed dinner with you uh, in London some time ago, and that you were a super pro and a good bloke. So consider yourself oh. hugged by Freddie. Oh, well, thank you very much. Well, give Freddie my best, very much. Of course I will. Listen, the other thing is just, uh, it's got to be worth it. I, I love this project that, that you that you're doing. Uh, it's got to be worth you contacting the, the, the British Tennis uh, Association, Roger Draper and his crew, because something like this would go down, I think, very well in, in Great Britain. And as I understand it, Mick Jagger's probably got a spare Winnebago hanging around from some of his tours, so you could <laughs> couple the two up together. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that sounds great, John. You know, I think I think what I would like to see out of this whole V-Lander on wheels traveling to to clubs um, as a former professional, as a former world number one, I would like to see you know a, a former athletes do that in every sport because I think there's a lot of small countryside clubs. They don't have a chance. They have, they don't have a big team. Uh, they don't get a chance to see live professional football or ice hockey, whatever it may be, or even meet former stars. So their dream to become a professional player is very. It's hard to 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 um to catch really so i think that every sport should have somebody out there promoting the sport but also giving the kids something to touch when it comes to professional athletes and you're absolutely right because that's that is the sport's future uh, Matt, so this is uh, Rob uh, in the studio as well, Rob Piccala. Um You came from a really great era of tennis players, and especially in the sort of uh, men's section. Which, in your opinion, of the people you played in your era was the best player, in your opinion, other than yourself, of course? Well, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to say. I did play... Um uh, Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi towards the end of my career and I think I got beaten uh, the worst by Andre Agassi uh, granted he was number one or two in the world at the time and I was sort of around 30, 40 in the world but I think once I played Agassi and Sampras the game had really changed and they were hitting the ball much harder uh, so it's hard to compare um, in my day the guy that could play the best on a given day I think was John McEnroe he, he could make you feel foolish look foolish and uh, um, and if he didn't play well, he'll he'll uh, <laughs> he'll get at you. But uh, you know, then again, Jimmy Connors is a great competitor. I've only played Bjorn Borg once on the tour, and he threw two games at me because he's a nice guy. So, you know, I'm very fortunate. I play with all the play with all the best players. But again, I've I've watched Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer play, and even hit with Nadal and. Um, I mean, up close, those guys are unbelievable, and I don't think anyone could touch them and uh, not even be close to them. Dom here again, Matt. Uh, the French Open, a tournament, like I've said earlier, you've won on three occasions. You're going to be there. It's in about three weeks' time. I mean, Rafael Nadal's form on clay, it continues. The Monte Carlo Masters, he won against David Ferrer, a repeat of that final again at Barcelona the week after. Can you see anybody beating Rafael Nadal on the surface? You know, I can't really. I mean, I can p possibly see somebody like Robin Söderling, who beat Nadal uh, a couple of years ago at the French Open. Potentially Juan Martin Del Potro, uh, the Argentinian, who won the U.S. Open a couple of years ago. And because he won the U.S. Open, he beat Nadal. He beat Roger Federer in the final. So he's done it before. But uh, again, on clay, it's not like 
Nadal is uh, is that good right now on clay. He's always going to be that good. As long as he wants to win, he's going to be hard to beat. But but I'm I'm a little bit surprised that guys don't um, don't push him a little bit harder, uh, and that they don't uh, they don't believe a little bit more in themselves when they play against him. But again, he's most probably the greatest clay court player of all time, and and I would love to see him win another a sixth actually French Open title because he's a great guy, not only a great player. Novak Djokovic has had a great start to the year. He's still unbeaten. I think 27, 28 matches thus far. Clay is not yeah. his favourite surface. But do you think with his confident start to the season that he might start producing some better form and maybe challenge Nadal um, at the French Open on clay? You know, I do. I think that, uh, you know, he's going to get there as, as seeded number two. So he's going to have to play Nadal in a potential final. And I think it's, it's easier to play Nadal in a final because there's no tomorrow. You don't have to worry about how tired you get. Um, but at the same time, three out of five sets is the problem for Novak Djokovic against Rafael Nadal on any surface. He's beaten Nadal now twice in a row in America on hard courts. But that's two out of three sets. And that's sort of running like running half a marathon. And uh, Nadal runs much faster in a full marathon and uh, Novak Djokovic so far in his career hasn't so I think he might believe he has a chance against Nadal but but um, hmm, I don't know I think they're worried about winning games not winning matches against him on clay Matt's spoken as eloquently as you do on, on uh, Eurosport listen thanks so much for talking to us today it's been a great pleasure to talk you've been a great champion uh, have a great time up in Madrid um, best of luck with uh, V Lander on wheels and best of health to your son as well Matt's and uh, hopefully we can have a chat to you again in the future looking forward to that thanks again for talking to us all right guys thank you very much